Hey everybody, welcome to our talk. It's from rockets to cellos. It's about practical applications and considerations when considering wirelessly enabled solutions using expressive uh, solutions. By day, uh, I am an entrepreneur and uh, and and technologist. And Soren, uh, just a hobbyist and a nerd uh, who likes filling around. And we just like creating cool things. And we'd like to share some of the things that we've learned and uh, how we've uh, hit our head into the wall many times, day after day, but in the end, it turns out to be worthwhile. And uh, hopefully some of our tips and insights can help you uh, understand how to accelerate your development from idea to creation. Alrighty. So first of all, I wanna start off with, we know everything there is to know about Espressive. No, not at all. Um, basically, when you start off, you know, doing the research, watching all the YouTube videos, reading the forums, you know, when we started thinking about uh, microcontrollers in general, we thought, okay, we got this. I'm an engineer by, you know, training. Uh, Soren's an engineer as well. We can figure this out. And so you start off with a certain amount of confidence that comes up. And the more you learn, the more you're like, yeah, I got this. I can do it. Until you get to a point where you realize life is complicated. And you realize there's a lot more to know about everything, not just the type of hardware you choose, but what sensors, how you integrate integrate with it, what kinds of programming languages. Uh, you change power consumption. What what wireless protocols are you going to use? How are you going to uh, design your antenna? What what network topography are you going to use? So you'll find over time our confidence level, you know, as inventors, uh, tends to go down. Simply because you realize the world is a lot bigger, just like the world of Minecraft here in the background, where you can see your you know nearby surroundings and you think you mastered your area, and then as soon as you start exploring the world, you realize the world is huge. And so we're going to give you a little bit of a taste of what we've encountered, and hopefully show you some time as you develop your own products. Mm -hmm. So we first started off with the end in mind, right? As they say, begin with the end in mind. And so our goal was to figure out. Can we start off with just a wireless button that could be a data node that could easily just measure some information or be a call button and send it to other ESP nodes or other microcontrollers throughout our house or throughout a restaurant or throughout a hospital, what have you. So that's our wireless button. And so our, in order to do the wireless button, after checking out many different microcontrollers, we have really started to appreciate the beauty of the uh, ESP C3 series, mm. which is right here. Um, but I'll give you a show about that later. And uh, we combine that with the ESP Now technology and Wi Fi and ESP Mesh, and it works out really well. But, Soren, what happens when you combine a wireless button along with an environmental sensor? Then you get a home weather and monitoring station. Uh, you're able to have these just around your house and just measure any data that you want to have. Now, what happens when you have all this data and uh, it's just a regular monitoring station and you make it slightly longer range, maybe slightly faster, and you put it onto a rocket? <laughs> well, there Stop you go. The rocket. So you get a model rocket telemetry trick, uh, telemetry and tracking system that utilizes basically what we built for the home weather station. And we're going from measuring uh, the temperature in the backyard, in the attic, in the back house, you know, in the garage, wherever, in the attic. And now you add in GPS tracking, LoRa for long range communication, and an IMU, which is an inertial measurement unit. That's like an accelerometer and, and gyro and, uh, and magnometer, which is a compass. And now all of a sudden you have a very, very tiny package that can be used uh, to track um, that basically will be about this size, and it can be used to track all this information, which is far smaller than standard commercial off-the-shelf uh, telemetry packages that are sold for model rocketry. Mm -hmm. But Soren, what, what happen happens if you make that really long range? <laughs> <laughs> really long range. Okay, uh. so <laughs> if you add about 30,000 kilometers between nodes, well, all of a sudden, you have now a high-altitude weather balloon system. So basically, we want to get a big balloon, fill it up with helium, let it go up in the sky, take some pretty pictures of our little space astronaut in, in space. And the thing is, how do you recover the payload afterwards? So that's where you have your rocketry tracking system. You add in the long range antennas and access to public gateways through LoRa. And now wherever it lands 200 kilometers away from here, we'll be able to track it and find it. Mm -hmm. But what happens when you now put this on the moon? 
explore on Mars or simulate doing so in the desert here. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can actually start working on an autonomous retrieval or a tracking system. So you could just have a relay drone and send out a rover to maybe pick up your rocket or whatever payload has fallen. So basically the concept here is Soren's like, you know, I want to work for JPL, but I want to actually work on simulating what it's like to create the rovers and create uh, uh, in integrity and uh, perseverance, ingenuity, excuse me, the ingenuity drone and perseverance. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so we thought, well, why not just do it here? And so make a robotic rover and make a drone that can communicate to each other and have the drone be able to help guide the rover to picking up the payload package mm -hmm. from the balloon. Now, what happens when you combine uh, everything that we've learned, which is about robotics and microcontrollers and add in a little bit of music? Then you get what we called Robello, uh, just robot cello, uh, where we have digital signal processing on the chip, and you can have recording, playback, a bunch of cool audio effects, distortion, everything you want. Uh, so this is a uh, early version we have. I've got it in my background right here. Um, it's just an, a cello for doing wacky things, and uh, it's doing all of the processing ourselves. So what you can see at the bottom, uh, can you see my mouse here? I'm not sure you can. Uh, no, it's hidden. Oh, away. Okay. So, oops. Uh, you, you, you can't see the mouse. but You off. can? Okay. So if, when you see at the bottom, there is a foot controller and it's this guy. All right. So basically we just took a little doorstop, pushed in a button. At the bottom, you have a C3 and a battery and that's communicating via ESP now to an onboard uh, espressive uh, C3 that picks up those signals and feeds it as input uh to a teensy so this is a, another microcontroller and another manufacturer called teensy and basically this has an audio shield which we've been experimenting with before we discovered espressive systems in addition this uh my controller uh system we designed custom designed this board mm -hmm. and had it manufactured and, and are playing with it this is version three now um this can send the audio signals back to the subwoofer that's inside the cajon drum. So all of a sudden, instead of having cables everywhere, we're using wireless communications, um, being able to play the audio from the electronic cello and uh, being able to pick up on input as well from when the drum is hit to record it into an SD card that's on my controller. And all this is being enabled through the expressive wireless um, communication systems. Right. So after understanding the projects that we've been working on, just for fun in the evenings, uh, it leads us to what are our actual requirements. And so when thinking about how to proceed, our requirements were they have to be small, they have to be light, it has to be wireless, integrated ideally, so that things won't come apart, whether it's from vibrations going up in a rocket or from a cello being carried around. And it needs to be battery powered because who wants to be plugged in and limited by that? And also we need to have really good power management so that it could last a long time. And we'll go through this. So basically we're looking for something as small and as light as a feather. And there you go. <laughs> um, so let's go through what our experience was in thinking about dev boards. When we get started, we started using Arduino. I think it's how most hobbyists got in this. And we started with this about a decade ago. Um, it's really great. It's a great place to start. You do rapid prototyping, you know, but it's a basic platform right now. And uh, so from that, we quickly moved on to the Teensy line of my controllers. We don't have any complaints there for what they are. They are very powerful, very small, very active community and a very helpful community. Um, but they don't have integrated communication. And compared to others, because they're so powerful, they do have a high energy requirement. So then you go on to the Raspberry Pi. We experiment with that a little bit. And uh, you know the thing to remember with the Raspberry Pi versus our needs is it is a true computer. So that means that it has the advantages of a true computer. It has multi-threading. It's actually running the operating system. You're actually connecting to it to do the programming. And it has integrated wireless. But on the other side, commercially, even though it's supposed to be 5 bucks or 10 bucks on Amazon, it's not. And it tends to be very expensive. Um, it cannot tolerate hard shutdowns because it's a computer. You might corrupt it if you do. It has much higher energy requirements than the others. As you can see, it's 1.2 watts. It's larger in general. The feather is still small, right? But 
it's just not really comparable to what we're trying to do with others in terms of making a custom PCB board. So then we started exploring and we came across other uh, integrated microcontroller boards that incorporate this press of chips. And that's what led us down this route of we thought, what if we could use the expressive chip, put it into our own custom PCB, and the best way to play around with learning how to do that is to use an existing dev board. And these turn out to be really inexpensive. They're like $15 for three of them or something like that. Uh, so it's a great way to get started. It has integrated wireless, it's inexpensive, and most importantly, it's optimized for low energy. You can see when it's in deep sleep mode, it's using like six milliwatts compared to like, you know, 1.2 watts. Um, basically, it means that the same size battery would last 200 times longer uh, with the expressive system. So it's not that I need to last 200 times longer, but it could be a smaller battery. Um, and also, you can see that the things we're, we're doing didn't really require a lot of processing. It's a lot of data management and wireless communication. So it turned out to be perfect for us. So getting started, how about the software development environment? What did you find, Soren? So um, for our project specifically, uh, there are major differences if your uh, um, microcontroller is running on pre-compiled C versus interpreted MicroPython or CircuitPython, uh, because it, it takes more energy to be able to process that, and we wanted to maximize power savings. In addition, uh, we just found Arduino to be a lot e uh, very easy. Um, VS Code and Platform IO works. Um, you can use anything, but just uh, Arduino had really nice integrated examples and code was efficient power wise. So we decided to just stick with it. Yes. So our, our lesson here is we thought, okay, now you've been playing in the playground of Arduino, let's grow up and go to a more professional development environment uh, like what my uh, team members use for my company. But the reality is, we really like the integrated examples in Arduino. And when you look at uh, comparison, tests on YouTube by other professionals, it turns out that the code developed is just as efficient as using any other IDE. So of course, we'd love to learn how to use Espressive ID more efficiently, but as we're hobbyists and we're learning ourselves, we decided to stick with Arduino and we're pretty happy with that. So that leads us to the dev boards. And you'll find when you start getting into this, uh, they're like an addiction and you start buying them like candy, uh, trying to solve different solutions. and um, it's really interesting. So let me take you on our path. Are you able to see my mouse? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, we started off with the Arduino and then we went to the mega because we wanted to control a big kind of robot initially. And then from there we thought, okay, let's make the jump and go to the teensies. So we started off with the smaller teensies and we went to the 4.1s like you see here. That's actually what we ended up using in the, uh, PCB that we developed for Rebello. And in doing so, we're looking for a wireless solution. And we're looking for a solution for the rocket and for the balloon. And that's what led us to these. This is a cube cell and then the Health Tech LoRa Wi-Fi boards. Um, what we really liked, we thought this would be great. They're all in one. They have GPS and they have LoRa. It's like, that's almost everything that we need. But we encountered a lot of problems with doing the actual integration. And we weren't able to uh, solve these through the communities and through the direct uh, communications with tech support that we needed. And we thought, okay, let's jump on to the one that has Wi-Fi plus LoRa together, and we could add in our own GPS. But there themselves, there's some non-standard issues that we encountered in trying to use these boards and integrate them with other uh, sensors. And the main most frustrating thing is that the example code uh, generally didn't actually work. Um, so. From that, we thought, well, let's look at the chip that's powering them, it was Expressive, and we worked with Expressive directly. We're not paid or anything by Expressive, but we uh, went to the website and we understood what they did. And so we got, and so we discovered the C3 chip, which is right here, and these dev boards, which are, excuse me, um, and this dev board, which is a Teleton Robotics uh, dev board, highly recommend it. It's actually turned out to be really, really good. And uh, I'll go through the rest of what we have displayed here in a moment. But the main lesson that we learned is not all boards are created equal. <laughs> what so, do we, yeah. And what do we mean by that? So uh, we were doing some range tests while we were developing our uh, button platform. And at first, we started off using the ESPW Room 32 dev board. 
and we were getting maybe 2.23 meters of range. Um, and that definitely was not going to cut it for our applications. And so we, we started to give up a little bit. But just on a whim, we, we uploaded the exact same code onto the C3 uh, by Tetlin Robotics. And the main thing to note is that the antenna is extended beyond the PCB. And there, we extended from two to three-ish meters up to like 60, 70 meters through multiple walls, uh, through our entire house, multiple uh, metal cabinets. So not all boards are created equally. Sometimes something just won't work and you'll have to keep trying with another board and it will work. So feed the addiction. <laughs> yeah. Um, to basically experiment and mm -hmm. just try different boards, right? Don't give up. Honestly, at this point, when we were using uh, this board, we're like, wow, this is impressive. Like, you know, the marketing does not at all line up with uh, what our experience is. Um, because, you know, you'll see videos of where they're controlling, you know, lights from 500 meters away using their ESP now technology. And again, we were getting like three meter <laughs> distance and through a single wall, but through a so... single wall. Yes. But then it turns out it's actually real. Um, you just have to experiment and try them. And then also remember, our goal is ultimately to make our own little custom PCB that can fit these scenarios. So that's why we love that we could actually see the chip that's being used. And then we know that we'll be able to integrate it ourselves when the time came into our own board. Something else that's really interesting is that not some antennas marketed for LoRa 915 megahertz, which is the long distance communications, low energy, um, long range, low energy uh, protocol, is that they're not actually optimized for that. And this includes the antennas that are shipped with the boards, right? So you'll see as an example here, this shows, uh, this is a, an antenna signal analyzer, and it shows the sensitivity at 915 megahertz. And you'll see, for example, when you just look at the stub antenna directly connected, it has almost no sensitivity at the frequency that's supposed to be working at for LoRa. However, if you include the pigtail with it, and then all of a sudden it is perfectly tuned so that's a lesson. We thought that we'd attach this directly to the PCB. It turns out you really shouldn't do that unless you have other optimization for impedance on the board itself. And you need to keep the pigtail on. Secondly, uh, when we look at this antenna, which is shipped with some of the boards, there is absolutely no sensitivity around 915 um, either. So it turns out that this is another reason why maybe the boards had, had bad range. Now. Before we get into selecting antenna types, I wanted to share a little bit about what we under, you know, have learned about decibels, power, and sensitivity. When you get a GPS module or when you get different antennas, they'll say, oh, it's a plus 2 dB or it's a plus 12 or plus 6. Or a GPS module might say it's uh, you know, 140 dB sensitivity. What does that mean? Well, basically, every time you increase a dB by 3, you're getting twice the power output. And when you double the power, which is six times the dB, you get twice the distance, theoretically. And for audio? Uh, for audio, every time you increase 10 dB, that accounts to about two times uh, increase in perceived volume. Great. All right, so now let's go on to the actual antenna types. First, there's the lowly monopole, AKA the cut wire, that's cut to some fraction of the wavelength. I signal. wouldn't say lowly. It works pretty well. <laughs> yes, that's true. And now if you take the same wire and you put it on the opposite side to act as a ground, that's called a dipole. Then you have the uh, trace wires that are built in as part of the PCBs like that. And as you see on the C3s and other platforms, or you have a coil, which is basically the wire that's wrapped with a certain coil spacing and a certain diameter to generate a certain amount of impedance through induction uh, that generally has to be about 50, mega, 50 ohms. Um, but it's a little bit harder than it seems to coil the wire exactly as it needs to be to make a good coil antenna. Then you have a stub antenna, which we already reviewed in the previous slide. And then you have a patch antenna, which you can basically stick on as a sticker, or they can be as big as a plate. And uh, it's just a solid copper side on one side, and the other side you have the ground. And uh, that ratio of dimensions is what creates your antenna. And then I wanted to point out that with GPS antennas, you'll see this little back. At first, we thought it was a sticker or something. This is actually your antenna. And you'll see the little marks there. Those marks are actually there to tune it. 
they are not like manufacturing mistakes. It's fine tuning for the antenna. Now, the other type of antenna you could always use is what's called a Yagi antenna. And the Yagi antenna is, is very sensitive. You can get a plus 12 dB, all right, improvement. But the challenge is it's big and it's highly directional. So these are all tiny on the order of centimeters. This is, you know, 80 centimeters, almost a meter long and highly directional. So if you're working with two objects that aren't precisely aligned with each other, we quickly find that actually the lowly wire antenna um, works quite it's well. Better. Quite well. But what's something else that we learned? Well, when we see people doing comparisons on YouTube of range tests, they'll usually like lay their uh, PCB on the table and check the range that way. And that's absolutely wrong. Um, the reason why is you have to have minimum spacing from the ground to where the antenna is. That's why most antennas point up. But the reality is you just need to elevate it off of the ground, roughly about at least a quarter of a wavelength as we found through just experimentation. I don't know the physics. I'd love you to tell me what the physics is for that effect. But here's what we can share with you while you're getting started. How to cut the exact right length for a antenna. You simply figure out the, the speed of light divided by the frequency. So example for us, the 915 times 10 to the 6, because it's megahertz. And then you end up with the exact length that you need to have for your wire antenna. And you'll see through uh, research done by others that actually the wire antenna turns out to be almost as sensitive as the coil antenna and much less directional. So when you don't know the orientations between nodes, it's a great way to go. With a dipole, we suspect in our own testing, we're getting much better results. Now, when you talk about line of sight, like Espressive will say you might get 200 meters line of sight range or something like that. Um, you have to keep in mind for the Fresnel radius. Tell us about the Fresnel radius. So the Fresnel radius essentially says how far off the ground or how much clear area you have to have in order to actually get a high quality signal. So for our use cases, you, uh, say you have a rocket payload lands, you want to communicate with that payload. If it's on the ground and it's suitably far away, you're not going to be able to get any signal. At one kilometer, the Fresnel zone is about 30 centimeters. 10 kilometers, it's about one meter off the ground. No way you're, you're staying one meter off the ground. So uh, you just have to keep in mind uh, when you're able to get signal and when you're not. And then how do you get around that? Great. So uh, in the real world, if due to either the Fresnel zone or maybe weird terrain around, you'll want to have some way to ensure that you get communication. So this is where we start talking about network topography. Here in this simple diagram, you can see we have a base station communicating via a relay uh, in order to get messages from the payload. And that relay could be another rocket. It could be another balloon. It could be a drone. It could be a large, you know, a highly mounted antenna. And again, this terrain doesn't necessarily need to be a mountain. It could be like just small little boulders in the way, small little rocks, unevenness in the terrain. The fact that your payload and your base station are not both the minimum distance above ground to be able to communicate with each other, considering the, the radius, the frenzel radius. Right. So. Now that we're talking about network topographies, we're going to get a little more technical. So there are three major ways that uh, you can go about structuring your network, either point to point, which is where you just have two nodes communicating directly with each other, or you can have hub and spoke. Hub and spoke is a really powerful model because it's great for power saving. In this model, you have a bunch of uh, nodes around a router. All of these nodes can be asleep because they don't need to work on forwarding messages. But when they do need to send something, they just wake up, send a message to the router, and that router then takes it to the rest of your network. Maybe it goes to a gateway. Um, and the gateway just connects your local network to the internet or uh, the LoRaWAN network, uh, the, the Things network, anything you want. Uh, you can also have a mesh network. Uh, this has a lot higher power consumption because every single node is active and listening for a message from any other node. But this is good because you have uh, higher network security. You don't have as many points of failure. Because say one node drops out, you're able to reroute your message along a different route. So uh, mesh networks can be very powerful if you need uh, data safety and aren't as worried about power. But let's take a look at the different types of 
uh, communication uh, protocols that we considered using and where they stand. So here's a little table we put together. I have to say, take this table with a big grain of salt, as we'd say, um, because it's based upon data from the interweb. Um, and the reality is we haven't tested these directly ourselves, and that's the only data that we'd like to trust. But in general, you'll see that ESP now, as an example, is good for some relatively small pack payload packages. I think it's like 250 um, bytes per transaction, and you can do up to 60 or 70 per minute, um, up to you know Wi-Fi. And each of these have advantages and disadvantages. Keep in mind, this is a logarithmic scale. So uh, basically, you're going much further distances with these different communication platforms. And so it gives you a little bit of an idea of what to use. You can take a look at this a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Tell us what we actually ended up using. OK, so uh, for our specific examples, we mainly rely on ESP now. Uh, because for our buttons, we didn't need to get a very long distance. And so we could just have peer-to-peer -peer in a hub-and-spoke model, and uh, we could save a lot of power. For the cello, we just have uh, communicating uh, communication via ESP now in each of the pedals. Uh, for the buttons, it's ESP now to our relay, which then goes on to the rest of the network. Other people might use uh, ESP Wi-Fi mesh, but it really depends on your uh, scenario. Uh, we are also uh, looking at using Bluetooth 5 A2DP uh, profile for uh, sending audio from the electronic cello to the subwoofer. Alrighty. Um, so there are a lot of different ways, now that you know about uh, network topology, that you can actually communicate on a network. Uh, the main ones that we were looking at were LoRa, and uh, ESP now. LoRa is a physical layer protocol that uh, is used for point-to-point -point communication. Uh, and most of the uh, boards that you're using are not able to handle a, half, a full duplex. They're only half duplex over their time slices. Uh, but it doesn't really matter if you're able to connect from LoRa to a gateway. Uh, the cool thing about LoRa is that it's very, very long range and very low power consumption, although that does decrease your data rate. Now, using LoRa, you can have LoRaWAN. This is a network protocol that runs on top of LoRa. Uh, it has public satellites and public nodes that you're able to, or public relays that you're able to go to, and it's a very standardized protocol, so multiple devices can communicate with each other. On the other hand, if you want to implement a true mesh instead of a hub and spoke, then you could use Radiohead, which is just a nice library for handling LoRa communications on the SPI HopeRF boards. Um, and with the mesh, of course, you have greater power consumption, but it's a true mesh, and it's got pretty good uh, implementation. On the other hand, if you know the structure of your network, so it's not needing to be adaptive, there's a nice hobbyist library called Farm Data Relay System uh, that gives you amazing modularity for being able to have data sent either via LoRa or ESP Now and uh, having devices able to translate between the two and then just connect to, an, um, uh, to a gateway and uh, go to the rest of your network. And you'll notice the last two actually require SPI LoRa boards. So tell us about SPI versus UART. OK. So the two main boards on the market are the Hope RF RFM95W and the Rayx RYLR series. Uh, the Hope RF is SPI. It uh, works easily with Radiohead. It's got a small form factor, and it's used on most chips that are LoRa enabled. Uh, you also get to add whatever antenna you want. So if you've uh, listened to uh, our antenna research for uh, dipole, full, uh, full dipole, half, whatever, uh, you can put whatever antenna fits your use case at whatever orientation you think will be best. Unfortunately, the pins don't match exactly breadboard spacing, but you can either put on individual wires or there are a lot of adapters that people have made to fit breadboards. On the other hand, the Rayx series is great. It's user friendly. You don't need anything to start with it. You just send an AT command of whatever you want, and it's nice for peer to peer. Unfortunately, it doesn't have much support for mesh networking or uh, any other uh, complicated uh, network topology. Um, and it is also slightly larger than the RFM uh, Hope RF board. But it's still really good when you're getting started for peer-to-peer. -peer. One thing to note is that the two LoRa boards don't communicate with each other immediately if you're using uh, Radiohead. And so you'll have to do a couple changes in the code. One, you'll have to enable promiscuous mode to change the way that Radiohead structures the messages for the Hope RF. And two, 
Uh, the regs, uh, RYLR boards, always append the length of a message in the very beginning. So if you're trying to read that on the Hope RF through uh, Radiohead, you'll get like a garbage byte in the beginning, but that you'll just have to know is the length of your data package, and then you can fix it relatively easily. So the main lesson here is even LoRa boards, even by the same manufacturer, are frequently not actually compatible with sending LoRa messages to each other. So don't get, don't give up, don't be frustrated. So what's the purpose of this talk? That's the end of it. Um, basically, we just wanted to help inspire and help other people get started in this hobby and to invent and create new things. In general, after surveying uh, many other microcontrollers, including many implementations of the expressive um, dev boards, um, in general, it's definitely been an adventure, but it's been a good adventure. And uh, we highly recommend uh, the system and the platform and don't give up. So look forward to seeing what you create. And uh, hopefully by the time this comes out during the Q&A, we can show off what we've accomplished. That's it. Yeah.